series. So anyway, so I'm Barbara Green at JUFO, and I actually serve as the Research Partnerships Manager of the Community Engagement Corps for the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies. And on behalf of the center's leadership, I wanna thank you all for join, joining us for the fourth session in our Land Foundations of Trust Moving Toward Health Equity series. This episode sponsored by the Center's Intervention and Implementation Science and Community Engagement Corps explores core social and behavioral aspects of trust and engagement with public health measures in relationship to the COVID-19 pandemic with an eye towards lessons from HIV work. Uh, we aim to stimulate dialogue that can shape shape programmatic and research agendas that address structural inequities in public health and in medicine. We hope you will be able, we hope that you were able to attend our first three sessions uh, titled Legacy of Racism and Building Trust, Community Engagement, Representation and Respect, and Risk and Decision Making in a Climate of Uncertainty. uncertainty. If you didn't have the opportunity to attend or would like to go back and listen, the presentations are online with links to our COVID, um, uh, with links to our CAPS website. Uh, today, our two amazing speakers, Bisola Ojikutu and Greg Gonzalez, will speak on hesitancy and harm reduction, focusing on the need to reach people where they are with respect to promotion of public health guidance. So before we get started, we have a few um, housekeeping um, things that we would like to share, which is um, at the end of the presentation, please look for a survey uh, that we hope you will complete. Also at the end of the, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'm sorry. And also at the end of the presentation, uh, we will allow time for Q and A. Uh, if you have any real burning questions at the end of the first presentation, we will try to accommodate them. Uh, but if not, then uh, we'll wait until the end. And we also really encourage you to put your questions in the chat. And so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Judy Arbach, who will uh, introduce our speakers. Great, thank you, Barbara. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, this has really been a special series and we're really great. Uh, grateful to Bisola and Greg for joining us for our final session um, in the series. Uh, I think you all know me, but I am a professor affiliated with the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies in the uh, Division of Prevention Sciences at UCSF, um, amongst other things. So I'm going to just, in the interest of time, go straight to introducing our speakers. The one thing I'll say in advance is I'm guessing that your um, presentations might be different now than they would have been a few months ago when we <laughs> invited you, given the trajectory of the, of the pandemic. So I'll be curious uh, to see what's changed. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce both presenters, and then we'll just start right in with our first, who is Bisola Ojikutu, who's an infectious disease specialist whose research focuses on identifying structural and cultural factors that promote HIV and STI risk and serve as barriers to HIV prevention, care, and treatment. And she is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, an associate physician at Brigham's and Women's and Massachusetts General Hospital. I have to say that slowly because there's all these ands in there. Associate director of the Biobehavioral and Community Sciences Core within the Harvard Center for AIDS Research, or CIFAR, and director of the CIFAR Community Engaged Research Program. Dr. Ojikuto has dedicated her career to studying and rectifying inequities in healthcare access experienced by people living with or at risk of HIV. Our second presenter is going to be Greg Gonzalez, who is assistant professor of epidemiology, he's associate adjunct professor of law, co-director of the Global Health Justice Partnership and co-director of the Collaboration for Research Integrity and Transparency, all at Yale University. Greg's research focuses on the use of quantitative models for improving the response to epidemic diseases. And although he's an early career investigator, having just received his PhD in 2017, I think of him as the mid to maybe even late career activist, uh, having worked in HIV and other global health issues for over 30 years in such organizations as ACT UP, Treatment Action Group, 
Gay Men's Health Crisis and AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa. So this makes Greg, and actually I put Visola in this category too, as what I always call scientist activists, or in Greg's case, maybe an activist scientist. I'd be curious which one you choose. So without further ado, we'll begin with Visola. Thank you so much, Judy, and thanks to the other organizers of this event for inviting me. Um, I, I really appreciate the distinction of, of being an activist and a scientist because I do um, take both of those roles very seriously. So my research team has, has thought quite a bit about these ideas related to mistrust in regards to how our systems and institutions either work or don't work, more often don't work, to promote behavioral change in the uptake of any preventative interventions, including COVID-19 vaccines. I've also been um, involved, as I'm sure many of us have been, in our local community engagement and all of our vaccine access efforts, and spending a lot of time talking to communities, um, as well as you know, being a vaccinator and trying to um, you know, promote uptake of, va of vaccines. Um, so I'm going to discuss my experiences as well as um, show a little bit of data regarding an ongoing study focused on vaccine confidence within the Black community. And hopefully this will generate some discussion. You know, I reviewed the previous lectures in this series, in this series and I was really impressed. I thought that um, many aspects of mistrust have, have probably been discussed in detail. But I, I do want to reiterate that um, mistrust is essentially the absence of the belief that institutions, including healthcare systems, the government, the pharmaceutical industry, as well as healthcare providers and other researchers, genuinely care for patients, participants, or their community's interests. Um, mistrust also exists in regards to innovation. Many of us um, are involved in HIV-related work, so we know mistrust. Trust is, is a barrier to PrEP uptake. Um, certainly other biomedical therapies, you know, it, it really is, is a problem. Certainly it has been identified as one of the um, root causes uh, for the staggering racial and ethnic uh, health disparities that persist in our country and beyond. And within communities of color, mistrust in all of its forms is driven by historical and contemporary structural racism. And I, I really do try to emphasize the contemporary part of this. This isn't necessarily about you know, events in the past. This is really about what's going on in the here and now. And at the root of mistrust are systems and institutions that were never really designed to be trustworthy or to engender the trust of non-white individuals. So as such, mistrust, from my perspective, is really a reasonable, normal, and rational response to an adversarial environment. So I work with a number of psycho psychologists, <laughs> including Laura Bogart and uh, a number of folks who have served as both my mentors and colleagues. And, you know, from the psychological perspective, you know, mistrust is really a functional coping mechanism. And it's actually a protective and adaptive survival mechanism that is, is quite important because as a coping mechanism and survival mechanism in the setting of oppression and adversity, what it does is it can actually promote resilience. And, and that actually makes sense. And I'm gonna give you an example and it, it can empower individuals as well as communities. So, so for example, on the individual level, you can have a patient and that patient may be black or, or, or some other person of color and they may have experienced racism within the healthcare system and they may feel mistrust and skepticism regarding treatments that are offered. These feelings could make them disengage from the healthcare system. But what they could also do is lead that patient to ask a lot of questions, to seek out second opinions, to advocate for themselves in a way that has positive results. So that's resilience, it's actually self-empowerment. Another example in the community level throughout the pandemic, we've seen how mistrust in government and in healthcare systems has led to the formation of all these community collaborations and coalitions led by Black and Latinx and other Native American individuals to address the stark disparities that have been noted, including vaccine access. And frankly, these coalitions, when you really think about it, this is a form of activism. I mean, this, this is really a manifestation of community resilience, empowerment, and self-determination. And that activism has arisen as a byproduct of mistrust. So conversely, though, as, as I stated, um, for that same Black patient that I talked about, mistrust may also result in disengagement from care and rejection of important interventions such as vaccines. So it's obviously something that we, we address, but I think we also have to think about the positive aspect of it. And I think we have to figure out how to harness that positive aspect because mistrust isn't, isn't going away. So we wrote about this dichotomy in a commentary that is under review and hopefully will be accepted um, in uh, AGPH soon. So how do we conceptualize mistrust in regards to vaccine uptake? 
So a number of frameworks have been developed over the years. You've probably heard about a number of them. I mean, it's, you know, mistrust has been all over the news. Vaccine hesitancy has all, all been all over the news. One of the most frequently referenced is the three C's conceptual model. And it's comprised of complacency, which is not perceiving a need for vaccines, convenience, um, access, affordability, availability, and confidence or trust in vaccine effectiveness and safety. So if you look at this um, model, it's, it's, it seems very individualistic, right? I mean, it seems like there that it, it really focuses and, and puts the onus on the individual in regards to vaccine decisions. So I, I think that in that respect and in others, I think this, this conceptual model is, is flawed in its framing. You know, I'll talk about the actual individual, individual components of each one of these domains, but in terms of its framing, I, I think that it's somewhat flawed. Um, in addition, I think it's also important for us to note that most of the data regarding vaccine hesitancy, quote unquote, pre-pandemic was not conducted amongst racially and ethnic diverse populations, okay? And it was, it was primarily focused in on, on pediatric pop, uh, populations and parental decision-making. Um, but I do believe, again, that what is described in each of one of these domains is relevant, and it does emphasize that vaccine decisions are complex and certainly not um, driven by any simple set of factors. So this is really a bit off the cuff. It's not something that we publish in terms of a conceptual model, but I think that it's more appropriate um, if you think about what's happening within and has been happening within, within Black communities and other communities of color in terms of you know, a vaccine uptake as well as other interventions. I mean, this isn't just about, uh, isn't just about vaccines. If you think about the idea of beliefs, okay? So we talked about in the other model, um, this issue of complacency, and whether or not uh, you know, vaccines are necessary. Well, beliefs just aren't, aren't just about self-perceived risk. They're, they're about what's happening within one's social network. What, it's about shared norms. It's about community values. It's about, it's about perceptions about prevention in general. Then there's access. And I talked about affordability and availability, which is you know, in, in the other, the three C's model. But there are also trade-offs of obtaining vac vaccination, particularly um, a vaccine that may lead to side effects, necessitating time off, when you think about the stress and chaos that many of our patients live under on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, of course, the concept of trust. Well, you know, trust and confidence, you know, one could interchange the two, I guess, in, in a way and that was in the previous model. But what that model left out is this baseline mistrust in the setting of systemic oppression, which has to be accounted for if you're thinking about what are the variables that are predicting whether or not somebody will take any intervention, again, whether it be COVID-19 vaccines or, or anything else. So because of these and other reasons, um, vaccine confidence amongst Black individuals has been lower than within other racial and ethnic groups throughout the pandemic. So lowest in September 2020, and this is from the Pew Research Center, um, and that was you know, prior to Pfizer and Moderna announcements regarding the efficacy of their vaccines. And though confidence has steadily increased and probably is increasing even further than what it was when they took this, um, when they, they collected this poll data in February, it still lags behind for Black individuals. And I would be very surprised if it still doesn't lag behind. So in order to understand the determinants of vaccine confidence amongst Black individuals, we conducted an online survey um, from November uh, uh, 17 to December 2nd of last year. And participants for the survey were drawn from the American Life panel. It's a web panel. It's housed brand. It's not as diverse as, as we would like it to be, but it was what was available. And everybody was sort of scrambling to, to understand some of these concepts. So we, we use what we have. Um, in addition, we, can, we convened a group of community stakeholders, all from HIV service organizations like the Black AIDS Institute and others to collaborate on this study. And this was mixed methods. So we had the web uh, survey, but then we also did some, some interviewing, which I'll, I'll talk about. In terms of key findings, um, we basically had 207 individuals, so 65% response rate, and the demographics are, are here. And again, we had to sort of use what we had, so it doesn't necessarily look like a snapshot of, um, of the U.S. in terms of the Black population. But what I wanted to emphasize is that, you know, we posed a number of questions um, and posed a number of statements to see whether or not people agreed or disagreed. And here, if a vaccine were available to prevent COVID-19, I would not get it. And essentially, 35% of people strongly agreed or agreed, and then 25% um, uh, basically said that they didn't know. So of course this was earlier on in, in the in the um, in the pandemic, but I think it tells us a, a story that could still be told now. So we also conducted bivariate and multivariable um, 
logistic regression predicting willingness to be vaccinated. And these are the bivariate results, which indicate that participants who had high confidence and need in terms of vaccination, they felt like vaccination was important for their health and well-being, they would be more likely to be um, vaccinated, while those who had high government-related mistrust, mistrust in the, in the COVID-19 vaccine itself, and those who reported race-based COVID-19 related mistrust would be less likely to be vaccinated. And I'll explain the race-based um, COVID-19 uh, mistrust in a moment. And then in, in multivariable modeling, um, essentially, people with higher vaccine confidence were more willing to be vaccinated, higher COVID-19 vaccine mistrust were less likely to be vaccinated. And interestingly, people had more people within their social network who had a positive sense about vaccination, who were willing to be vaccinated, those individuals would be higher, to, um, had a higher willingness to be vaccinated. None of these findings are particularly surprising, but these data do emphasize the importance of mistrust and emphasize the important, importance of one's social network, which I'll come back to in a minute in regards to vaccine decisions. So just to say a bit more about the race-based mistrust scale, you know, I think this is really critical to our understanding of how to promote vaccination within communities of color. So we assess the association between perceptions of racism in the healthcare system and vaccine intentions, and a majority of individuals, 63%, believe that within the healthcare system, Black people are treated differently from people um, from other groups. I'm surprised it's just 63%, but only 35% believe in, in regards to specifically to COVID-19, Black people receive the same medical care from healthcare providers. Providers, and these beliefs were significantly associated with low vaccine confidence. So we did some qualitative interviewing. Essentially, we conducted um, 23. This is ongoing, though. We thus far 23 interviews, structured, semi-structured interviews have been conducted, and five interviews with community leaders um, to sort of explore these findings a bit more. And there were three findings that I just wanted to point out. First of all, uh, mistrust is multifaceted. Certainly, as I mentioned, medical providers, providers, healthcare organizations, pharmaceutical companies, and the government. Um, Mistrust and racism, very important that one of the um, ways to address vaccine hesitancy, back, low vaccine confidence within Black communities is to preface any discussion of vaccines um, with the acknowledgement of structural racism. I noticed that um, I presented some of this to the CDC and they, they have some document, they have a document now that talks about structural racism before it gets into vaccine issues. So I think that's something that a lot of people are talking about. And then this wait and see concept. Again, there have been a number of studies which have looked at the fact that a lot of people aren't absolutely refusing. They're really saying, well, you know what, we're just gonna wait and see how things go. But I think it's important for us to note that people are still waiting and seeing even now. And we'll, we'll show the data as to where we are in terms of vaccination next. And basically, <laughs> here it is, as you see right here, um, as uh, eligibility restrictions were removed, obviously uptake increased. However, vaccination amongst Black and Latinx individuals um, continues to lag significantly behind nationally. I know it, it's lagging behind in California, certainly lagging behind in Massachusetts. But I really can't stress enough that though there's been this overwhelming concern regarding vaccine hesitancy, it's been all over the media, access barriers, <laughs> real systemic structural barriers have significantly contributed to these disparities. Okay, so what has been done and what can we continue to do about this? Well, I would say in the short and medium term, medium term um, I think a lot of people have talked about community collaboration. And as I said, these coalitions have been built at first, not really as in, engaged per se in the access process, but really pushing to be involved and really um, power shifts occurring where they're you know getting resources redistributed to themselves directly and then moving forward within their own communities. Issues of transparency, um, trying to promote transparency in terms of um, information regarding vaccination, equitable access, certainly that's an obvious, workforce diversity, an obvious, and I already mentioned acknowledging structural racism and, and mistrust. The issue though, and I think this is what everybody is worried about right now, is that all of these sort of short and medium term interventions will be just that, short and medium term, and they will not create some major inflection point in regards to what we know are problems within equities um, system wide. So longer term, what we do need to promote and what we need to kind of really start thinking in a visionary way about how to do is how to make these short and medium term changes sustainable. You know, how to, how to really create structural change. I think that's gonna be the problem and it, sh it should be on everybody's plate right now. So briefly, I want to mention in regards to structural change involving communities, this has been an ongoing issue. Those of us who are here who are researchers, we know that what researchers do typically is they run to community when it's time to get people to enroll in studies. This is just the nature of the clinical trial game, right? And not just clinical trials, really anything. 
So instead of doing that, instead of instead of you know doing these sort of outreach engage, engagement type practices, which are one off, which are unidirectional, what we are saying is that in terms of structural change involving communities, what we need is real community collaboration and actual investment within communities through the research process, through the access process, and beyond. And so what I mean by investment, I'm just going to give you an example. So we have a Black Boston COVID coalition within, um, uh, within Boston and within it's beyond actual Boston. And one of the things that was done was that a lot of money was given to outside entities to provide vaccination within the Black community. So in order to change the dynamic and to shift power, what we advocated for was that resources be given directly to the Black Boston COVID coalition. I mean, long-term resources to like, workforce diversity to build, um, you know, real, you know, um, systems that could last beyond this whole COVID-19 piece, really thinking about how do we create a system of ownership of a culture of health within, within all of what we're doing with, with COVID-19. So that's what we're talking about here. And I just have one more slide, as I, I know I've, I've probably gone over at this point, but what about individual level strategy? So I've talked about structure and systems. The reality is that right now, What's happening is that we have people who are still on the fence and who are or, or who are absolutely still refusing. And it's really become an individual level interaction that we need to promote. And so what I'm saying in this slide is that we all need to develop communication strategies that promote dialogue, that don't stigmatize mistrust, that actually engage people in discussion about what their decisions are, that actually meet people where they're at in terms of um, making these decisions, not just about vaccines. Like I said, this is really about um, issues beyond vaccination. And I think motivational interviewing is, is certainly a way to do that. And some, some strategies um, that I, that I you know, highlighted here, I think are important in terms of normalizing mistrust, as well as um, not correcting people, as I've seen happen in interactions um, between folks who are making decisions about, about vaccination, as, as well as not getting angry with people, you know, when they decided that they don't want to be vaccinated right then and right there, and providing ongoing support and then allowing people to make their own decisions. Certainly, I don't, I'm not really one who promotes, you know, incentives or mandates per se. I think those are a mean to an end. They're not an end and a sustainable end in and of themselves. I really think people need to make their own decisions in regarding their health. So I'm going to end there um, and uh, just say thank you. And hopefully this will generate some discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Bisola. That was terrific. Um, you talk fast, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's all right. You're in good company for sure. Um, I think we'll go straight to Greg and save some questions towards the end. Um, I'm trying to think of a few. I've already got a few myself, but um, we'll see what comes in as well. And I think you've already introduced, you know, one of the tensions for all of us in uh, the COVID response, as in all responses that we've been engaged in, is this um, balance between public health imperatives the communitarian, the solidarity, and the individual rights and responsibilities and uh, engagement. So we'll probably talk more about that through Greg. So without further ado, Greg, over to you. Okay. Hi, everybody. So uh, I'm going to channel three people right now, and then um, I'll reveal who they are at the end, but I, you'll guess at least one of them. Um, so to my young friends out there, life can be great, but not when you can't see it. So open your eyes to life to see the vivid colors that God gave us, the precious gift to our children to enjoy life to the fullest and to make it count. Say yes to your life. And when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. <clears throat> Taken together, these findings suggest that while syringe exchange programs may lead to a reduction in diseases spread by needle sharing, lowering the costs of obtaining clean needles and other supplies unintentionally encourages more drug use, leading to more opioid related overdoses. While many of these overdoses can be reversed in the emergency department, syringe exchange programs do little to prevent mortality rates from rising in subsequent years. And the last one, I know people are alcoholics and I don't buy them a bottle of whiskey and I know people who want to kill themselves and I don't buy them a bullet for their gut. So this is a 40 year journey through harm reduction and its discontents. The first speaker was Nancy Reagan. Um, the second one was, was Annalisa Packham, who's a health economist who has a paper out talking about the moral hazard of needle exchange. Her mentor, Jennifer Joliak at, um, at Texas A&M, has went out on naloxone as a moral hazard, um, again, promoting drug use. Um, 
And the last person who spoke was Mike Jones, who's one of the county commissioners in Scott County, still is, uh, who voted to close the needle exchange in Scott County just a few weeks ago. Um, so we know overdoses are up 30% uh, over the course of the pandemic. Um, and we also know that we've had outbreaks stretching back to Scott County, but subsequently in Boston, Seattle, West Virginia, Cincinnati, um, uh, uh, and Miami, I think I said, might have said twice. Um, but right now, needle exchanges are on their way out in Scott County. West Virginia has voted to shut theirs. Atlantic City and Asheville are now considering votes to shut theirs down as well. Um, so when we want to talk about harm reduction, I think we need to go back to basics and realize the struggle we've been having for, for, for 40 years in this country about drugs, alcohol, and harm reduction and how we approach risk. Um, let's talk about harm reduction in the context of COVID. You know, my colleague at the uh, law school, Amy Kipsinski, Kipsinski and I um, wrote several pieces in the Boston Review last spring, um, one called The Loan Against the Virus, one called A New Politics of Care, and one called Markets Versus Lives. And the idea of that last one was to, to challenge the false dichotomy that we're either protecting the economy or we're protecting lives. But when we think of false dichotomies, I think we can also um, think of risk, right? Um, risk is an on or off, all or nothing, right? And um, in the context of COVID behavior change and COVID prevention, it, the dichotomies about safe and not safe um, are, uh, are, are as, are as um, unconvincing as some of the, the remarks that I talked to you about just now about harm reduction and drug use. Most people don't have a choice about what to do or to stay at home. Many of us on this call probably were fine being in our apartments or our homes over the early months of the pandemic um, and relied on frontline workers in grocery stores and Amazon warehouses, on farms to, to pick the vegetables that you, that you were able to eat. Um, so many people didn't have a choice about how to protect themselves against COVID. And Simon Mungi from the University of Chicago has a very interesting paper out um, that talked about the, the kinds of employment and the kinds of labor sectors that were under greater or, larger, greater or lesser risk during the height of the pandemic. Um, and they, 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 they ran um, towards people who had, could not stay at home and were in high proximity professions. And those professions also tr tracked with demographics um, most impacted by, by COVID-19 mortality and, and by transmission. Um, you know, the other thing is it might have been possible to stay at home and board ourselves up for a few weeks, but we needed to think about how to do this for the long term uh, uh, and, and, and craft a set of behaviors that we could live with. You know, there was a Gallup poll that I sent to somebody just this morning where many, many Americans think COVID is over. Right? They think it's absolutely over. And this overlaps with the same demographic that thinks they don't need to be vaccinated. Um, but for most people around the world, this is not over. Um, there are many countries who are going into new lockdowns over the Delta, Delta variant. There are countries that have just been in free fall in Brazil and in India, now in Indonesia, in which the idea of um, returning to normal, we just got an email saying we can go back to the office without masks here at Yale. That's all fine and dandy, but my colleagues in South Africa uh, are, are in lockdown again uh, after the next wave hit them and their hospitals are full. Um, so what do we do, right? Um, the idea of harm reduction and COVID prevention really, I think was pioneered by Julia Marcus, a friend of mine in Boston at Harvard Medical School, uh, and Ellie Murray, uh, an epidemiologist, another epidemiologist at Boston University, again in Boston. And the idea is to give people some flexibility in their lives and their choices. And we recognize behavior change is hard. Ted White, who was a fellow at Yale, and I think actually was at CAPS in the UCSF for a while, you know, talked about this in the context of HIV prevention and said, you know, behavior change is, is, is really difficult. And we need to, to understand that um, we're, not, uh, we're not writing prescriptions for drugs or medications. We're asking people to make fundamental changes in the way they think, the way they believe, the way they act, the way they have done so for, for months, years, decades on end. Um, and also realize that risk is a moving target. You know, now everybody's like, should we, we, should we be wearing masks now that we have a, a, a new variant of COVID uh, racing across the country? And the question is for you, for your, for your partner, from your community, it's a moving target. Things are not the same as they were uh, in June, 2020. Um, so 
this isn't harm reduction. You know, harm reduction was a movement for and by people who use drugs, right? It was a philosophy, it was a, a, a life-saving mobilization strategy. But what we do, what we are doing in, in the context of thinking about risk reduction in COVID is borrowing some of their tools and putting the idea out there that risk is on a spectrum. Um, and that the idea is to survive, right? It's not just to say no, it's to survive, to make it through the pandemic, whether that's HIV or whether that's COVID-19. Um, maybe the better um, analog for this is the idea of safer sex and the pamphlet that my old Dr. Joe Sonneman and one of his patients, Richard Berkowitz wrote called How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, One Approach. Um, and it's, it's about how you manage a life, how you manage the pleasures of life um, and the disappointments in the context uh, of something that's out there that's going to try to kill you. Um, and sometimes it's not for us, it's for others. You know, we've been told how much, you know, staying at home was doing to prevent uh, our own infections, but those of our communities. Um, but even wearing a mask, people say like, why are you wearing a mask? You're vaccinated. Why are you wearing? Because many people in my community are still not vaccinated. And some people are under the impression that it is over and it's fine to take off masks because all is gonna be well. And thinking about our work and harm reduction in COVID as, as a form of solidarity brings us back to the roots of the movement that, that gave us harm reduction in the first place. So we can learn things from HIV, right? We can learn things from the AIDS response, but we shouldn't presume that we need that what we need to do can be divided by pathogen or by disease um, when it's all about how we treat people, right? Meeting people where they're at. Um, it, it's funny, this is the second time Bazola and I have been on a panel together and I find the thoughts going through my head start to interdigitate with, 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 with comments you made, but you know, think of health not starting at UCSF or Harvard Medical School or Yale or um, any of the tertiary teaching hospitals that, that many people have worked with, worked at during their careers, but in the communities and their empowerment and their self-determination. It sounds nice, right? But that's not the system we built, right? If you think about the disparities in COVID uh, transmission, those professions, those labor sectors that are that were at high risk, the disparities in deaths, and then the disparities in access to vaccines, not about hesitancy, about, about the infrastructure to, to deliver them to people who need them. Um, we've not created a, a, a system of community care, but a system of abandonment, right? In both outcomes and interventions. We didn't meet people where they're at, we left them alone against a virus that Amy and I uh, talked about over a year ago in our piece in the Boston Review. Um, so what do we do? Um, we can organize that people using drugs uh, did and people with HIV did during the AIDS epidemic um, and organize to save each other's lives. It's, it, it's if we wanna honor the spirit of harm reduction, um, we can organize together this time to kick the shit out of the system. So this never happens again. For many of us on this call, this is our second epidemic, maybe our third. If we start to count TB, we start to count HCV, it's four. If we start to count Ebola, it's five. Um, we have systematic structural issues that we need to confront. And many Americans may think the epidemic is over, but we will not be uh, safe until we are all safe. And that's sort of the, the lesson of, of the AIDS epidemic, the, the, the model that people with AIDS and people who use drugs gave to us for the past 40 years. And it's something we should take forward um, into the next months and years ahead. Great, thank you very much, Greg. Um, really both excellent and provocative presentations as we would hope and expect um, and resonant with lots of things we've talked about in our past series, um, which is probably predictable. My head is swirling with like multiple things that I would love to just have conversations with you about. And until I see some more questions come in, I'm going to just go ahead and start on a couple of them. Um, and pardon if any sound a little bit more like a statement than a question, but the last uh, clause and all is I would love to hear what you think about this, even if I don't pose it as a question. In the first case, I think thinking about Bisola's presentation and yours and the current reference a lot to structural racism, there's also a historical feature to racism. And I, I kind of partly want to separate out historical from structural. The structural is the representation of what gets embedded and institutionalized over time. But it seems that there is a need increasingly recognition of the importance of actually telling 
histories from different points of views now, how we kind of got to this space, not just what the current structural arrangements look like, or even recent ones about redlining or, you know, discrimination and healthcare access, uh, institutionalized laws and policies around banking and access to money, all the things we're hearing a bit about with regard to structural racism. But there's a collective unconscious and uh, building up to these things that is really about history. So I'm curious what both of you think about the role of history in how people um, engage with health, harm reduction, anything uh, related to COVID. So that's one question. Do you want a, any response to that, either of you? And I guess, sorry, sorry, the corollary is how much history should we be telling? Like, I think, you know, we also see we're retelling the story of HIV in this moment because a lot of people have come up without knowledge of how it used to be. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think what you're saying is, is of critical importance. Um, there's a caveat, though. So let me say why I think it's of critical importance. Um, you know, history is 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 only as good as the person telling it, you know, and the stories that we've right. all heard um, in regards to history are, are so overwhelmingly skewed and they bias so much of how we ourselves, even I say we black people perceive ourselves because we've taken what we've been told and we've ingested because that's, that's the context that we lived in that that's, that's, you know, what somebody has told us and those are the dominant systems. So that's the structural, that's the system that has created the perceptions, our understanding of who we are and our place in this world. And that's very destructive. The caveat though, that I found with going to history lessons is that, um, the way that our world is structured, it is, it is very temporal. It's very um, based in the, in the here and now. You know, we want to know <laughs> what is happening now that's going to affect our lives right now. You know, and so when we when we go back to the past, sometimes I've gotten I've gotten eyes glazed over, you know, because I've done obviously we've all done a lot of these town halls, and we want to talk about history, but at the same time we want to get to the, the, the root of now. We we want to address the now. You know, so I, I think that that's that's the hard part. But I think from an academic standpoint, from what we should be doing within our school systems, obviously, new people need to be telling the stories. New the, the people who really understand the stories need need to be telling the stories. And there needs to be, an, it, it, I think, even more importantly, there needs to be an openness to hearing those stories because I, I don't know that it's there. And I'm not just talking about white people. I'm talking about everybody <laughs> and re reconceptualizing, creating a new narrative about why our system is what it is, and not to say that it's necessarily a negative narrative per se you know it is a story of our history and that's that's actually you know really incredibly instructive and it tells us a lot about what we who we are as people and where we could go as people and as we're thinking visionary we need to understand where we've been in order to figure out where, where we should go great thank you greg so you know this spring we taught a uh we have a we teach a class between the public health school and the law school called the global health justice practice and this is the COVID edition and we did teach history um, this term, and we talked about the history of epidemics in the United States. Um, not many people know about the smallpox epidemic after the Civil War, um, because it was happening to mostly freed slaves. Um, and Jim Downs wrote a book called Sick from Freedom, um, in which he describes um, the, the epidemic and the way it was covered up, um, downplayed, and obscured until he started writing about it all these years later. We had them read about the plague outbreak right before the great earthquake in San Francisco um, and the way politics played out in the context of that pandemic. The gasoline riots in Texas, nobody knows about the gasoline riots for decades. Latino uh, migrant workers coming across the border were fumigated with things like Zyklon B um, because they were uh, infested, even though none of it happened to be true until one person stood up and said no. And the gasoline riots are about a woman who, who, who created a riot on the bridge from, from, from El Paso to Juarez, um, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Um, and nobody knows what happened to her. But I think, you know, it's, it's not, history is not just about the bad things. It's about that act of resistance. It's about the Black Panthers health clinics uh, in, in the 1960s, the women's health movement. Um, the, the sort of deep, uh, resilience and and power that that community have shown in the midst of all of this, um, and I think it's important to learn it because otherwise you 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 can't learn its lessons and and you know in the old sort of hoary adage you repeat it over and over again. 
Right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna keep asking questions because I'm not seeing others coming in. Rochelle, tell me if I'm missing anything here. Um, so, sitting in San Francisco and somebody who is like totally, you know, immersed in everything written about COVID these days, because part of what I try to do is act as a translator for lots of my friends and family who aren't gonna be reading and understanding a lot of the scientific literature in quite the same way. Um, so I do all of that. And what it feels like from our point of view is, uh, and those of us who are trying to stay aware globally, a tale of two pandemics, to put it crassly. In San Francisco, we have, you know, 70, 80 percent of the entire population that's eligible is vaccinated, at least with one, if not with two doses for the two dose vaccine, fully vaccinated. And um, on an epidemiologic level, if we didn't have, even if I guess we did have people coming in from other places with low rates of vaccination, it's not unreasonable, given the science and what we know to date, for folks to feel like, I don't have to wear my mask anymore, you know, I can go and congregate now. This is what the CDC has told me is true. Um, and, and I'm exhibiting confidence in the vaccines. Here you all have been working so hard to get everybody, you know, non-hesitant and having confidence in these vaccines. Now my not wearing a mask and my being engaged in social life and stuff in this context of high vaccination is the right thing to do to also show my confidence in science. On the other hand, there's the uncertainty. We don't know about the, any emergent variants. We're still not entirely sure what's happening with the Delta variant and vaccine efficacy. So far, it looks good. Um, and then on the other hand, we have South Africa, you know, which is under vaccinated and overexposed. And just you know, like many countries Greg mentioned, really having very, very difficult times of things. So how one kind of copes with that reality, how are you supposed to be in the world when your little area seems to have done the right things, been able to do the right things and appears in the way people are phrasing things as coming out of the epidemic. And yet, you know, in all these other places, that's not true. Does that mean I should start wearing a mask in solidarity with everybody everywhere else in the world who doesn't, isn't as protected as a statement? But when in doing so, I'm kind of suggesting that other people, I'm not so sure these vaccines actually work. So I don't know how, if that made a lot of sense to you, but just I, I'm trying to understand or get from you your thoughts about how we, um, operate as individuals and communities in a context that it remains so uncertain, so nuanced, uh, where the science and the experience is ever evolving and realities are extremely different in different places. Thoughts? I, I think that's the question that everybody is um, <laughs> struggling with, quite frankly. I mean, I just had a conversation. Uh, we, we did a town hall, a community town hall last night and had a conversation with a number of community folks, um, leaders in the field. And essentially, that's what everybody's trying to figure out. You know, how do you um, remain true to the science and yet realize that the WHO just said to wear masks indoors because of the Delta variant. And yet, you know, at the same time, politically, you have our leaders saying everybody's fine as long as they're vaccinated and everybody wants to return to normal. You know, I think, I think the public health communication has been a struggle as we're all aware, and there really needs to be more of a balance um, in terms of what I talked about with transparency. And what I mean by that in being transparent is just what you said, Judy, is that realizing that there are a lot of unknowns out there. I mean, and how many people have you really heard just say that? <laughs> Look, exactly. we really don't know. <laughs> we don't know where this Delta variant is going. You know, we have these data about, you know, good efficacy in regards to hospitalizations, death, severity of disease. But we don't know what's happening, particularly amongst in those communities where um, vaccination rates are low. Interestingly, if you look around Boston, you look neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood, the neighborhood with the highest number of um, Black uh, individuals, particularly non-U.S. born Black individuals, is called Mattapan, okay? And in Mattapan, the vaccination rates are, say, I would say 39%, whereas you're talking about the, the um, you know, sort of South End and the um, uh, 
area where MGH, Mass General is located in a very, you know, expensive area, you know, high income area. You're talking about 70%, similar to what you were talking about in, in San Francisco. How about somebody show that data and say, look, <laughs> we have communities where there isn't um, high vaccination, there aren't high vaccination rates. Therefore, the reality is until we get higher rates, we all need to be protected and we need to do some harm reduction within those communities. Nobody's really saying that. Not to say the data isn't available online, but that's not part of our public health communication strategy. You know, there is, there has tended to be the sort of grouping. We're all under the same umbrella. We all need to sort of do the same things, and that we don't. <laughs> there is no equity here, and I think we need to acknowledge that there is no equity here. And maybe that's the inflection point that needs to occur: recognizing that we are in an inequitable system where there are many people who are still at significantly high risk. You know, the other thing to say is that, you know, you're talking about history, but public health used to be uh, a campaigner's game, right? Florence Nightingale campaigned for sanitary reform in India and the, in the UK. Um, you know, Rudolf Virchow was incredibly political after what he saw, what happened to the typhus epidemic in Silesia. Public health has a proud activist history. And all last year, we talked about the racial disparities and the inequities that drove the COVID pandemic. And now we're like, woo, the masks come off and we're all gonna party and we're gonna go back to our research jobs and do our NIH grants and write our publications. If public health can not take up the mantle of the inequities you see in, in Boston, in San Francisco, in New Haven, who else is gonna do it, right? I really feel like we have to assume sort of the legacy of public health and take the pump, that pump handle off the pump. We need to march into that committee room to, to, to ask for sanitation and water, water uh, and sewage policies to be changed in our, the, the point is, is that we need to address these structural issues now. Otherwise we are basically setting ourselves up for the next catastrophe. We know this, we know what the, the life expectancy differential is between the US and its peers around the world. And we know what it's based on, right? It's not based that we don't have a Harvard or a UCSF or a Yale or, or, or these wonderful teaching hospitals. We have a system that is designed to make us sick, right? And if, unless we deal with that in a real way as part of our work going forward, we're just gonna be you know, here together again in 10, 15 years with some other uh, health crisis, whether it's by climate or by pathogen. We have a question from Ross Boylan. Are you, are you on Ross and can you um, unmute and pose your question yourself? Are you still with us? No mic, he says. Oh, okay. So Ross says, it seems to me most popular discussion attributes all differences in vaccination to hesitancy. How can we keep the focus on other factors? I'm not sure what other factors you mean, Ross. You can either type them in or um, just let Gisola and Greg. Yeah, you talk about access. <laughs> He's talking about access. I mean, like so access. That's, yeah, yeah, that was so that, yeah, that's really the issue here is that, yeah. you know, there's been this overwhelming, this surfeit of um, concern around vaccine hesitancy, largely because vaccine hesitancy puts the blame on the individual, right? And I mean, that's much easier for us to point the finger at than to look at the system because you can't, at least people don't think they can fix the system, but theoretically you can push an individual to go do something. You can give them, you know, by push, I mean, you can mandate or you can give them a, you know, a, um, what do you call it, um, uh, uh, an incentive, or you can put them in a lottery or whatever, <laughs> and then they will go and they will um, supposedly overcome their, their hesitancy. So one of the things that we've been doing here in Boston, which has been a challenge, is really, and this is part of the activist part of how we should be proceeding as researchers and as scientists, really talking directly to the media about the problem, you know, getting it on the front page of the globe, like, look, here's our research. We, we did this analysis. It's very clear that there are not enough access points. It's very clear that mobile vaccination will work and will reach other places. It's very clear we need door-to-door -door vaccination because this is a number of people who we know cannot access or have not been accessing the healthcare system. So, I mean, it really is, a, the media has really been a, an incredible on, on a good way um, throughout this pandemic, but also in sort of shifting very easily 
shifting the way people think about things. You know, just like we said about the, the pandemic's over. A lot of that is, has been media that is, you know, has, has, has driven that thought, right? But it's also, like I said, driven this piece about vaccine hesitancy. Because again, I think it's, it's easier to write about. And I, I remember I had an interview with one of the outlets asking me um, what novel strategies could I think of to address vaccine hesitancy? And I said, well, you know, why don't we address structural racism and fix access to healthcare? How much more novel can you get? And that didn't make it <laughs> in the article. But, you know, that's really, to me, what, what actually needs to happen. So I think a lot of it is about, as Greg mentioned, being an activist and really talking about the, the, the structural issues. I mean, the other thing to mention is that, um, you know, in terms of good things in the, in the uh, American Rescue Plan, um, there's a whole bunch of money for community health workers and driving community health to the grassroots, which we should talk about, right? Um, you know, if we're going to build health from the, the, the ground up, that's part of creating new systems of access and care for people. So I, I agree with Visola, like the idea of focusing on the individual um, is like the same thing about blaming drug users and people who use drugs and gay men for um, the, the environment that creates um, uh, risk in their lives rather than, than dealing with the, the environment itself. Yeah, thanks. And I think vaccine hesitancy, vaccine confidence, um, part of what I'm interested in also is the extent to which any of what we're talking about is specific to vaccines and, and even specific to COVID, but um, how much the constructs that we're talking about are hesitancy and confidence in public health, science, human, you know, other human um, neighbors and things like that. Um, and just one more thing, and then I'll... I'll, I'll uh, turn it to Rochelle to ask her question, but I think we also often, all of us conflate the community that is hesitant and the reasons for the hesitancy, which actually are pretty diverse. There are people who have experiences of historical racism that influence hesitancy around biomedical interventions. But there are also a lot of political conservatives who are hesitant uh, white people who are hesitant around or resistant. So, I mean, there's even a spectrum of hesitancy and confidence. It includes active resistance to the vaccine for political reasons. You know, we can rehash the history of this pandemic and the Trump position on it that I think influenced a whole lot of people. But there's also a discounting of science uh, of the public in public health, a very um, I've heard from people who are not getting vaccinated, white people are not getting vaccinated. You know, they're, um, they just don't believe that COVID's that serious. They know people who've gotten it and they've gotten over it. They don't know anybody personally who died and they just think the whole thing is blown up and all of that. So I think we, we the progressive public health people have to also be sensitive to um, the spectrum and the nuances within these communities who are holding out um, and, and be clear about uh, all the facets contributing to that. Um, so I don't know if you have any quick comments on that. And then Rochelle had a question and she's doing the poll now. So Bisa or Greg, did you want to say anything about what I just spat out? You know, I would just add to what you're saying because I totally agree that, that there we have to be sensitive and understand there are many reasons and there's a wide spectrum of folks who are, who are hesitant. Um, there's also this unifying theme though, um, which I, I say is disenfranchisement. And I think that there are a number of white individuals, white conservatives who feel disenfranchised right now. They don't feel like their voices are being heard. They don't feel part of the process. They feel like the process is, is actually working against them and their belief systems. So I think that that's part of what's driving this as well as that disenfranchisement being felt in marginalized communities and in black and Latinx and Native American communities. So there is that one nugget. It's not the whole picture, but I do think there's a piece of this about inclusivity and how you include people in a process so that you move them all towards an end goal together. I think that that's a skill that I, I don't know that many people necessarily have. <laughs> That, that, what you brought up, Judy, is the hardest piece for me because I was looking at the vaccine maps and like, you know, it's like a political map, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the counties that are not vaccinated. And some of it's about like dying of whiteness and sort of the, the way in which um, certain politics were sold, um, tied to race and, and then linked to science and vaccines over the past year. Um, but part of me doesn't care. We have to figure out how to address it, right? Um, and part of me is like, I just wish 
Republican politicians would be vaccine ambassadors um, and go out there and say, we want you to get vaccinated and stop arguing about vaccine passports and stuff like this. And I know it's, you know, barking up the wrong tree because it's not going to happen. But the point is, you, you listen to the people who you trust and they don't trust me. Um, I'm not going to be a good ambassador to, 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 to many people uh, I know who are not getting vaccinated. Um, and we got to figure out how to, how to get to it because it doesn't matter who you are, who you vote for. Um, the virus is not going to discriminate in that way um, over time. Yeah, I don't think it's hyperbola to say that the um, response by many Americans was very much framed by the response by the president at the time, who completely and totally blew it. So to put it mildly, uh, had that person, had Trump actually come out and said, this is our collective problem, it's a big scary deal, we should all do this, that and the other thing together in solidarity, I think lots would be different. Not everything, but a lot. So uh, to your point. Rochelle, you had actually had a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to uh, pose it at this point, and then we will probably close out in just a minute. Sure, Judy, thank you so much. Um, I'll just draw attention to a couple of the other comments that are also showing up in the chat. Um, a good point um, from Omar Martinez, good point on the importance of changing the narrative on hesitancy. Let's focus on vaccine confidence and the systems and intersectional structures. And from Maya Ingram, I'd like to add to Ross's point that as scientists, we look to individuals to solve all health inequities and we need to reframe all of it. Um, and then my question was uh, just sort of tacking on um, to just ask the speakers if you have additional um, ideas that you haven't already shared about how we can address these health inequities as public health researchers and practitioners. Greg, you want to go first? So, I mean, you know, it's it's not a surprise what I'm going to say. It's just basically you're going to have to learn how to act up. Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, you're going to have to get arrested, but you're going to have to, like, it's more than NIH grants. It's more than and than writing your papers. It's more than clinical care, right? It, it means that, you know, the prescription you have to write is for social change. And there's so much hanging in the balance right now. Um, you know, this could be the end of a... a a long, ugly period in American history where like, we're ready to invest in things like human infrastructure and long-term care and all these things take equity seriously. That can be a, the future or it can be, you know, Trump light or Trump plus, right? And so the, the only way to do that is, is to take what we know about what makes people sick and makes people well, whether you wanna call them the social determinants of health or the political determinants of health and act on them you know, in your local communities, you know, and your states and, and, and you know, at a national scale, if you're able to. Thank you. Isola? Can I just, can I add um, that from my perspective, I think what's missing and what's always been missing is that we need to shift power. So much of what we're doing when we say we, I think um, is top down and it's about institutions. It's about NIH, you know, it's about, you know, these structures that are very exclusive. These are, these are clubs. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Gisola just froze on my, my screen. Is she frozen on everybody's? Oh, yeah. did? Right in your profound did state. You, did there. you get that? <laughs> these, are, these are clubs, you said. Clubs. We got the clubs. Right. That was yeah, important. These are, these are exclusive clubs. And I think that the only way to truly get to the root of disparities is to shift the power, the decision making power, in terms of where resources go, in terms of what the research questions are, in terms of how the research is conducted, in terms of what the activities are, and how long the input is, in terms of resources. It needs to go to those communities, those people who actually understand what's going on within their, you know, particular um, groups. Okay, I, I just I don't think that that's what we're doing. Even when we start setting up programs for workforce diversity to train minorities, whatever you want to call these the different programs, when we hire chief diversity officers or whatever, we're not shifting power. What we're doing is we're just, you know, moving things around and hoping that, you know, things will change. So I think to me, and that part of that is about activism. So part of that is about what Greg is, is talking about. But I, I do think we really have to turn to the community and we really have to think about how resources can be put into the, you know, the areas where they, they actually need to go. 
Thank you so much. And I guess I will add, because everybody expects me to add, that there's power within the myomedical establishment and the research establishment itself. And the social and behavioral sciences are often marginalized in that and are often the in-between between the basic and clinical and even epi scientists and the community. Um, and we need to sort of restructure the social organization of science to be much more in inclusive and respective of the behavioral and the show social, which obviously is behind everything we both have talked about today. <laughs> and we just keep saying it over and over and it still don't change. But um, I would like to thank our presenters, Bisolo Ojikutu and Greg Gonzalez for a really engaging session, a really wonderful way to close out our series. Barbara, thank you for co-hosting with me today and Rochelle for everything you do to make these possible. And seamless. Um, and I don't know if you have any last minute housekeeping comments, Rochelle, um, and otherwise we will sign off and say thank you to everyone for participating with us.